From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us here on AutoLine this week, where we're going to be talking about what's going on on the wholesale and retail side of the business. And that's because our special guest today is Forrest McConnell, the chairman of the National Automotive Dealers Association. Great to have you here on uh, AutoLine. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. Thanks so much. And uh, we also have Michelle Krebs from Auto Trader and Steve Finley from Ward's Dealer Business. And great having the both of you here as well. Thanks. Michelle, you got the floor. Well, I have to ask the, the big question, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett's getting into the auto re, uh, retailing business and has said that he's going to expand even further. What was your reaction to that? Yeah, I was very excited about it. I think it's a great endorsement of the franchise system. And, of course, Warren Buffett is a, a genius and is you know realizes that the franchise system is at, really good for consumers and the best way to sell and service cars in this country. So we're excited to have him uh, as a partner. Does it say something about the consolidation in, of dealerships into big groups like that? Well, I think, you know, 96% of dealers are small, most of them privately owned businesses. Mm -hmm. So there's still a small percentages of what you would consider consolidated bigger business. But I think like any business, that's changing and that will probably increase. Well, I remember when this consolidation business was getting started in the 90s, and it was um, groups buying uh, individual dealers and becoming mega groups and becoming public in some cases. And AutoNation kind of led that charge. Uh, manufacturers were looking at that and saying, what's going on here? Because you know, they were worried that the dealers were going to have this power to tell them what to do. There were crazy fears that AutoNation was going to come out with its own car line. But we've seen a shift now that the mega dealers are established. Now the mega dealers are being purchased. So you mentioned there's still a place for smaller independently owned dealerships. But what do you think of this trend where uh, investment companies are now buying the, uh, the mega dealers? And also manufacturers are, uh, took a flip on that. They're cool with that because they like the business uh, practices and disciplines and leadership that the megas have well i think you know we're we have uh, in the national automobile dealer association represents seventeen thousand six hundred franchisees in the in the united states and so they are about four percent uh are publicly owned and then the rest ninety six percent you know a lot of them are just dealers and i think some of that those percentages may change but there's you know it all boils down to taking care of the customer whether you're a big company or small, and making sure they're happy. That's what makes, makes business successful. But how do you represent an auto nation as an association here and then some small rural deal dealership in Wyoming there? Well, uh, NADA has done a great job doing that. And we have, for example, uh, uh, Sid DeBoer is on our board. He's with Lithia, so we have a, a wide range of dealers. So we, we do a good job. You know, the interest of big and small dealers are... are virtually the same. Uh, we, our, our job is to represent dealers in Washington, D.C. and to manufacturers and make sure that everybody has a level playing field and then let the competition begin. Sid being a mega dealer, by the way, just to yes. put, put him in context. First, I'd like to get your thoughts on the, the flip side of this, and that's got to do with Tesla, which has been carving out exemptions from the dealer franchise laws, which, as you know, but for the audience's benefit, are in each of the 50 states and have been written to really protect dealers. Now they're carving out exemptions because, like Apple, they want to have their own stores to sell their own cars. My question also uh, is tied in with we're pretty sure that at some point the Chinese are going to end up in this market too. And could they not take the Tesla precedent and saying, no thanks, we don't want to have anything to do with dealer franchises? Well, you know, franchise laws are really there to protect the consumer. And, and if you think about it, the, the first thing that, that the franchises do is price competition. You know, the biggest competitor that a Ford dealer has is a Ford dealer down the street. And in that being able to shop really drives down prices for customers. Now, take the fact if, for example, if a manufacturer sells direct, there's no inner brand competition that you can shop. It's a take it or leave it. So if you like paying full sticker prices, which customers don't, that's what happens if you just had manufacturers selling direct. And the other thing is, they have all the expenses that a, that a normal dealer would have now and there's one aspect I think a lot of people don't think about, and that's warranty and recall work. You know, for a dealer, uh, a warranty is revenue. So we're, our, our um, 
interest are aligned with the customer. We want the factory to approve warranty because that makes the customer happy and we make a buck. But the manufacturer, for a manufacturer, if they own that dealership, it's all expense. So they don't have an incentive to want to do that warranty work and maybe make an exception for a customer to make them happy because it's expense. So that's it. And then there's no substitute for all the local ownership that dealerships have throughout this country. We employ a million people nationwide and they're good jobs. $52,000 a year on average and they can't be shipped overseas. So dealers, and who, think about it, just common sense, who would be better running a dealership? Someone, a man or a, a, a lady who has money invested, average of $11 million in a store, skin in the game, running that dealership, or a regional manager that works for corporation that doesn't have anything tied up. Well, what's the NADA's position then on what Tesla's doing? Because it seems to me in the states where it has been able to get these exemptions to the franchise laws, the NADA or, or local dealer groups seem to be somewhat grudgingly but on board with that. Well, it, it's up to the states. You know, NADA deals with things on a, na a national level, on the federal level. So, but the, so policymakers in individual states have the right to make laws depending on what they think is best. Now, they have been some deals, uh, compromises made, so to speak, in New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and those are big states. And that may set a framework for other big states that if they feel like that's what they want to follow. But eventually, it's up to the states. Our job as the National Automobile Dealers Association is just to point out the benefits of the franchise system price competition, warranty and recalls, and the local benefit that dealers add to the community. Well, the franchise laws are at their strongest when they're preventing a manufacturer to come in and set up factory stores when there are existing franchise dealers. Everybody says that would be fundamentally unfair. Not that it hasn't been tried, but that's where you need franchise laws because you can't establish a franchise system and then start selling cars direct. Well, Tesla is not doing that. They, they don't have any dealers to begin with. So it's, it's the, the application of franchise laws there is a little weaker than the, the other Well, but the, the benefits of the franchise system, I mean, you have to realize these are state policymakers. So they're looking at what's best for their state. So they look at, do we want price competition that drives prices lower for citizens in our state? Do we want to have recalls availability, wide availability for recalls to be redone? Do we want to advocate for the customer for warranty work? And then 15% of all the national sales tax is generated by dealerships in the United States. That's local. That funds, funds local schools, local police, and all the other services that's important to the policymakers of those states. So I would just say they can make whatever decision they think is best for that state. All we want them to do is just take that into account. I, I agree with what you're saying, but what others have said, arguing in favor of having factory stores is, hey, now we can get rid of the dealer markup and we'll pass <coughs> those savings on to consumers. How do you answer well, that? Well, John, I'm glad you brought that up <laughs> because, you know, the, the dealer is not a, a middleman cost. The average dealership makes 2.2% net profit on percent of total sales. Now think about that. They build the buildings, they staff the stores, they buy the, and hold the inventory for the, for the manufacturers, and they make, you know, we're like grocery stores, razor thin margins. That's a good deal. And the other thing is we, we have the intense price competition as far as from cars, service, and parts. That drives prices lower for customers. Could I bring up the subject of car shopping, too? You talked about the, the consumers being most important. We are seeing change in behavior of yes. car shoppers. They're spending a lot of time on sites like ours, which we like, um, researching before, and they don't visit as many dealerships. They're also telling us, uh, Auto Trader just did our buyer profile, and they're telling us, we want to do even more online, things like financing, <coughs> doing all the paperwork. How are dealers reacting to that? What's your, what's oh, your take I, you on You know, that? dealers have embraced the Internet. You know, I love it. It's, uh, you know, Auto Trader, for example, it gives me an advantage as a dealer that I can sell a car to somebody and maybe it's not my market because they happen to see it online. And we do that all the time. So it's expanded, basically expanded your market that you can sell in. It's a big plus. But I think dealers are, smart dealers are adapting to online technology and to digital marketing. And I think it's a plus for 
a business. I think it's true with every business. Anything you buy, you're going online to look at and to check out. What has happened is customers are better informed. That's a plus in my mind because I want the customer to know, you know what's available to him to make a smart decision or her. They're happier that way. So the closing ratios of people coming in, people are m much more likely to buy because they've done a little bit of their homework ahead of time. And they not only do they check pricing on cars, they check interest rates out on cars to see. And uh, I think uh, an informed customer is a plus for this business. Well, not to get you two going at each other, but that would be fun. <laughs> but go ahead. That would be fun. <laughs> uh, what do you think of pricing uh, uh, transparency uh, from third parties? that are saying to customers, okay, here's the lowest price, here's the price you should be paying. Um, isn't that kind of disconcerting to dealers to have customers with what some people consider proprietary information? Well, you know, competition, one thing dealers dealers gravitate to is competition. You know, bring it on. We don't have a problem with that. I mean, that's just the nature of our business. And, you know, if customers want to, to look at different things to get comfortable about purchasing a car, but ultimately what you, what you see is people, it's like buying a house. They want to walk through the house. They want to touch the car. They want to see it. Is this really as big as I thought it was? You know, is this, is, is this really look, the color look like I thought? You know, that's a plus. So people still want to come and touch it. They do want to do research ahead of time. So I think it's a plus. Whatever, you know, the competition, the world's changing and dealers adapt. And that's just, that's one of the things that makes business fun. So you, you think brick and mortar dealerships will be around, I assume? I think you, uh, yes. I think brick and mortar is important. But I think your digital facility on the web is just as important. So I think you need to do a very good job on the internet because that's where customers go uh, first. So, so what would you say? What would be your vision of what a, a car dealership or auto retailing looks like? I don't know, five, ten years from now. What does that? Look well, it's like? interesting because NADA we actually had a study done on the future of automobile business, and there are some changes, uh, a little bit more consolidation. Um, the uh, facilities, I think a lot of it will stay the same. Uh, there is a bigger need for service to make sure service departments, for example, just something small. People are waiting. We've expanded. People are expanding their waiting rooms because people are, mm -hmm. you know, then take as long. Quick service is a lot more available to the customers. And so those are the type things. But it all boils down to, are you happy? with the way we treat you and take care of you. And it's not just selling your car. Customer retention is more important is taking care of you the entire time you own that car. That's the dealership's job. Make them happy while they own that car the whole time. And yet dealers still have uh, a general perception uh, that's not that great. If you talk to individual car buyers, they go, yeah, my dealer's not bad. I, I think they're pretty good. But what do you think about car dealers as a whole? Ah, you know, they're, they're kind of shysters. It's, Still, to the general impression, how do you change that? Well, I think people judge, you should judge somebody on themselves. You know, I think you always have to be careful of the gravitational pull of stereotypes, especially old ones. And, you know, people, they may not like lawyers, but they like their lawyer. They may not like doctors, but they like their doctors. And so, but I think if you treat people right, and our business is so competitive that if you don't treat people right, they're headed down the street to somebody else that's going to take care of them. But our, if you look at our business, we're driven by customer satisfaction scores. That's what I look at every morning I get from Honda, and I know dealers do. And if you don't do well, you'll be, the people will be talking about to you. I know most of the dealers I know actually pay their employees for customer satisfaction, for good customer satisfaction score. That's a plus for the customer, right? Because if, you know, if I have to make, make sure I'm making you happy and my pay depends on it, it's a, it's a great thing. I'm rewarding you, rewarding the employee for taking care of the customer. Let's talk about a hot issue within ADA, the Consumer Protection Financial yes. Bureau, which is a relatively new federal agency, does not like the practice of dealers adding a percentage point or two, or sometimes more in the past, but percentage point or two, to the a rate of a loan in, in compensation for their involvement in arranging the loan. And NADA has fought this uh, pretty harshly. Could you explain why and well, the, what's going on? The there? Consumer Protection Finance Agency basically feels like there's some anomalies that some uh, some groups may be paying more than other groups. But the, what I will tell you is discrimination is wrong, period, in any business. So 
NADA has come, come up with a solution that the Department of Justice had originally had from their materials, and it's that uh, dealers will set a set amount. That they, it's a voluntary program on the dealer's part. A set amount of what what uh, they will start a particular rate at, and then discount it for a legitimate business reason. For example, customer comes in, they found a rate on the internet or a credit union. Can you match that rate for me? And so, in, under the current system, all these dealers have opportunity to discount uh, interest rate for customers. Here's the other thing that very few people know: the rates that dealers offer customers or the vast majority are lower than you can get at your local bank or credit union. You walk into local bank and credit union, we love, we encourage people to shop because when they do, they'll come to the dealer and you'll get a, usually a much lower interest rate and that's a plus. The flat fee model, the problem is the current model is uh, because dealers bring a large amount of business to banks because we sell so many cars, they provide us with a much lower rate, so we compete. We force the banks to give us low rates that we can offer customers. Now, under the system, if we switch to flat fees, what happens then to the customer? This is not good for them, is, and all the customers that are watching this show should know that rates will go up because they will compete on raising, let's pay the dealer a higher fee, and then he'll send us the business. Well, that takes out the interest of the customer. Instead of lower rates, it's going to be all about higher fees. How does that have to help the customer? It doesn't. It hurts. Higher fee and higher interest. So right, you, sure. I mean, you know, somebody, instead of the, lowering the, the rates. The dealer is gravitating towards the higher fee, and the customer may be getting a higher but we're interest We're price rate. discounters. You know, there's 17,600 price discounters that dealers get, uh, that customers get to shop around this country. That's a huge plus for them. And it, it's lower rates. That's why 80% of all the car buyers, now remember, it's optional. You don't have to finance your dealer. But 80% of the people have shopped around and figured, wow, this is a good rate. And they go with dealers, 80%. That speak, those numbers kind of speak for themselves. Earlier this year, there was a, a big brouhaha about the number of subprime, uh, uh, not lenders, uh, the people getting subprime buyers coming into the market. And, and there was some alarm bells about that. Seven-year loans for cars. In fact, the, the, the brand that you sell, Honda, came out vociferously against other automakers doing this sort of thing, i.e. selling to subprime and extended car loans. What's the NADA's position or, or how do you see what's going on in the marketplace? Well, you know, first of all, I will say that if you want to go to the industry standard, there was a study done by Equifax and they, they, they say, and it's, I have a copy of it for you, but they say basically that there's not a subprime bubble. And l let me tell you their reasoning. Underwriting, a lot of people equate it with the housing market, what happened in housing, but underwriting, underwriting for housing is completely different because the theory was that houses, the prices go up. Now, underwriting for, for automobiles is different because cars are decreasing uh, asset. They, de they depreciate. So the underwriting is mostly based on the fact, can the customer repay, which is different what happened in housing. And so, uh, you know, that being said, for the subpar, for the buyer who's had some credit gains, you know, in life, I think everybody needs a second chance. And, and, and in this country, with very few exceptions, you have public transportation only in a few areas. You need a car to go a job. You need a car to support your family. And so I think it's, or take your kids to school. And I, that's, what, that's what that industry provides. It's got to be done, you know, correctly. But I think it's a big plus. You know, people need a second chance. And hopefully those people that have the subprime loans when they get that car, they'll build their credit back up and hopefully jump up where they don't. They can not be in subprime the next time they buy a car. Well, I think uh, talking about needs, dealers and manufacturers need subprime customers. They're a huge part of the market. You take them out of the equation, you're going to see auto sales drop. Well, well, and they went up because we got more subprime lending. And to your point, Forrest, everybody deserves a second chance. A lot of people were rated as subprime because of the Great Recession, the financial right. crisis. They lost their job or their home or their car through no fault of their own. They're good people, so they need a Absolutely. second chance to build that back up. No, you're 100% right.
What do you think about car sharing and what the impact, will that catch on and what will the impact be on uh, you know, it's dealers? In it's interesting. Um, I just personally had signed up with Zipcar when I was in, uh, out of town. But it's a, um, I think it's part, you know, a lot of it's rental for, for some mm -hmm. certain areas, I think, in big cities. I think it will probably expand. Um, it's just one thing, you know, always happens in our business is changing. But uh, people do like to have their own car, but there are exceptions that works for some people. And tied into that is this whole concept of mobility services. Yes. So, you know, maybe I go beyond car sharing and I incorporate uh, public transportation and other things. Has NADA looked into this? What, what's some of your long-term forecast? Maybe this is why Warren Buffett's so interested in getting into the dealer side of the business. But has NADA looked out long-term where this is all going? Well, you know, we've had, you, you know, I, I wish I could predict the future in life, um, but we have looked at it. But, you know, you take Warren Buffett. Now, that's someone who looks out in the future. And he, he's betting on the auto franchise system that works. And he realizes what it does for customers. It's a great deal for the manufacturer because we do it in a very efficient way, selling and servicing cars. We're a good advocate for customers. And, you know, that price competition, the total competition is the key. It's a big benefit to local communities and customers in the business. So, you know, things change over time. That's what makes life interesting. If it all stayed the same, it wouldn't be. But NADA, we, we are a, uh, a organization that represents dealers, and we change, too. And we realize that the world's changing. So we, we're excited about it. But with Zipcar, if it really takes off, isn't that a threat to auto sales? Uh, there was an analyst from City saying that um, what this country needs is families buying more than one car, you know, multiple cars in the, the uh, garage. And the zip car, it's the exact opposite. It's like, you don't really need to buy a car. If you do, you just need one car because you can rely on this zip car business. Doesn't that I fly think in the zip face car of what will, you guys you know, are in business for? Well, I think, I think zip car probably does serve the need to some people. It's a, just a really an efficient way of renting a car, which is what it amounts to. You know, people can rent cars now, and I think the technology has made it a little bit easier to uh, rent a car. The millennials are driving a lot of this, uh, and we're finally seeing them get into the car market. There's been great debate about whether they really want to own cars. Um, what does NADA's take, the dealers take on that? I assume they, they certainly want them to buy cars. It's a big uh, demographic. A absolutely, you know. And uh, I have two younger kids. I will tell you, you can't take their they they will not replay they will not give up their cell phones for anything. But that you know, I hear that they like their phones more than cars. But ultimately. You, it's not a choice. You don't have to make a choice between having an iPhone and a car. They want both. You know, it's the great thing is the mobility. You know, but millennials are like everybody else that goes up. They want good treatment. They want to get value for their money. And the really good thing now is cars are a great value. You know, and all the things that people want, the technology that's coming, safety technology is a huge plus. And then all the uh, connectivity that you have, it's, uh, I think, I think they'll enjoy it. So, I think uh, it's like anybody, I think the market and the products will adjust to what the people want at that time. Well, I was, I was going to say that they're driving a lot of the change. We see they're the ones that are using tablets and smartphones for more shopping. Um, are dealers adjusting to all of those changes that they're bringing? I think they are. You know, I think dealers have embraced the internet and I think uh, it makes it exciting. And I think if you don't, I think you'll be left behind. Are millennials that different as customers? Because we keep hearing about how they come in and they want, you know, instant service and they, they don't want a hard sell. And, uh, they, they want transparency everywhere. I mean, doesn't everybody want that? Yeah, I think so. I, you know, I, that was gonna, my remark was going to be, I think everybody wants things easier, more transparent. Uh, and I think we're all a little bit less patient, right? You know, things happen quick now, and uh, people want things done efficiently. So I think what you're serving, I think that goal to take care of the customer, to retain the customer, you have to make it easy for them to do business with you. Have you noticed them as being a different set of customers? I think everybody's changing. I mean, I, I really do. I think people want thing they're a little less patient. I'm less patient in, in everything I buy. You know, but we're in the service business. So it's up to the service provider to adjust to the customers that come in your business. And if you do, you'll be rewarded. So I think, yes, they, they probably are, but quite frankly, I think everybody is really wants what, 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 they're, what you're talking about. We're down to the last couple of minutes here. My question is, uh, 
During the bailout of General Motors and Chrysler, they had to get rid of several thousand, collectively, several thousand dealerships. What's been the impact of that? You know, here we are five years after it. What's the lay of the landscape, especially looking back to what happened then? I think it was a brutal time. Uh, you know, I have a lot of empathy for dealers that had their family fortunes, uh, you know, taken away from them, uh, lost money. Uh, you know, a dealer makes a huge investment. And that's one reason we have franchise laws. You know, those, those dealerships were closed when they still had mortgages they had to pay. And, you know, there were people that had 15 years left on a mortgage. And their business was gone like that. And that's one reason you have the franchise laws to protect people that make investments in your community. You know, and that's good for the community. If you're a policymaker, you want to make sure the business in your community have a little bit of protection to make sure. But, you know, the business has come back. Those who are fortunate enough to have been in it, it's a great business. Economy's booming. And we are a huge driver for local communities and the nation's economy. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, it's amazing that if you go back five years ago, things looked like it was the end of the world. Today, it everything's sure going pretty good. As we've talked about, even people like Warren Buffett want to invest in the business. So right. just amazing. Forrest McConnell, thanks so much for coming on Auto. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Been just terrific having you here. Also, Michelle Krebs from Auto Trader, Steve Finley from Ward Steeler Business. Great having you all along Thank here, you. too. Likewise. And I want to thank all of you for having tuned in to AutoLine this week.